Right. Thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm not going to keep you uh, beyond uh, 40, 45 minutes. Um, my wife advised me that I should not be rude, but rather entertaining, so I hope that I will be entertaining and not offensive. Um, I'm, I'm really going to talk to you about uh, the practice that I'm involved in, Noera Wolf Architects. Um, uh, it's been uh, established now for maybe 20 years, since 1985, and it's a practice that has been largely engaged with both teaching at various universities as well as, thank you, as well as in practice. And essentially our locus of practice has been South Africa, and I think that we've taken a, a fairly pragmatic approach. I think one of the advantages of being South African, a South African architect, or someone involved at least in cultural production in this country, is that up until 1994, the cultural boycott certainly meant that we were isolated and cut off from the rest of the world, which, thank God, happened to us, because we were not held uh, to the temptations that were presented to architects internationally at the time. So in a sense, South African architectural practice today is uh, caught in a very kind of interesting position because it's still, it still has a very strong modernist base. There's still an idea that architecture can be socially purposeful. There is an idea that architecture can make people's lives better instead of this awful, global, post-capitalist world that's emerging today of branding, of lifestyle design, and so forth. So really, I, what I want to talk to you today is about the kind of work we've done and how we place ourselves in that alternative form of practice, which I think is a, a form of practice which doesn't collapse itself into do-good work, where um, you simply serve other people and their needs and you become a problem solver, like, a, uh, like a, a utilitarian engineer might become, but rather to be an architect involved in the production of fine buildings that are socially purposeful and that work towards making the world in whatever modest way a slightly better place. Now, what is unique about South African architectural practice? Sorry. Uh, What is unique about South African architectural practice? And I think it's, uh, what is unique about it are the extremes within which one operates. The first set of extremes have to do with this idea of inhabiting very, very different worlds. There's the formal world of Western-based Cartesian thought, Johannesburg, a classic example, a grid that is similar to the Chicago grid except much smaller, Hillbrow, one of the most extraordinary residential areas in the world at an incredibly high density, uh, it's dysfunctional at the present moment simply because controls have, 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 have assumed new forms, but I think that the new forms are now mutating into something very positive. And then on the other hand, the other world in South Africa, which is the world of informality. Um, something like 90% of all the housing in the country are produced in any single year, is produced by people acting for themselves, outside of any legislation, uh, legislative framework. Um, it could be argued that this is a highly sustainable and very efficient and resourceful form of housing production. These people build houses that don't cost anyone any money. They use recycled materials, they're of no cost to the state, they're done imaginatively and resourcefully. The fact, though, is that the conditions that create this kind of uh, settlement are ones of extreme poverty and inequality, and that must be addressed. So there's a kind of, um, again, another tension of wanting to support informal, spontaneous settlements which our present government doesn't do to their detriment. I'm sad that the Minister of Housing uh, takes the position that she takes, which is that she wants to eradicate all slum, slum settlements by the year 2014. It's probably one of the most ignorant statements I've ever heard a politician make in their lives. But um, the fact is that we should try and harness the energy of these people and find effective ways of making that world work better for them. South Africa after 1994, this modern Cartesian world shaped by modern town planning and certainly spatial segregation through the apartheid, application of apartheid uh, spatial policies and the act of informality on the city. One of the great archetypes of the, uh, of, of modern, of, of the modern city is the elevated highway. Uh, what, a, what a more powerful symbol to represent modernity than that. And in Johannesburg, what people do is the spaces under the Freeways become these wonderfully occupied spaces which support markets, shopping centers, places where people live, 
which support a 24-hour life. So that the, the fact that you can have these two systems coexisting together in South Africa is a fantastic opportunity, I think, for architecture. Um, the, 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 the naive, in, in a sense, representation of modernity is again something that I think is, is, is quite startling in South Africa. This is uh, 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 an envelope that was decorated by a uh, Zulu artist, Tito Zungo, in the 1970s, sent a friend of his, Ronald Lukock, who was teaching at that stage in Cambridge University, and it's an airmail package. But I think what's interesting is the representation of modernity, the uh, jet airliner, and the way in which it's drawn. Similarly, this representation also by Tito Zungo of the modern African city, the vertical city, but done in a way that I think would defy anyone in the Western world. Gets me to the next point, which I also think is very interesting, because it, in a sense, does set us apart from um, the rest of the world, which is this idea that architecture is an art form, but it's brought into being in order to satisfy purpose. Without purpose, you can't have architecture. Now, that leads me to the next idea, that beauty is a curiously 18th century Western European-based concept. The idea of disengaged beauty. Beauty as a property in its own right. In most African languages, there is no word to describe beauty as a disinterested property. Something is only beautiful if it's useful. Beauty is always attached in the languages, certainly of southern Africa, to that of purpose. And this piece of art, I would argue with you, is the consummate piece of what I would consider to be African art. It's produced by a black artist called uh, John Mafangejo. He's dead now. But it really was about an artist who traveled around the country in both South Africa and Namibia during the years of apartheid, recording atrocities. So he became a historian. And through his artwork, he served the purpose of recording the, the events of history. So his art served two purposes. It was both beautiful in its own right, but it served as a historical document. And I think that is a, a salutary reminder to us I think in this country, that that is in fact the purpose of art, and it's certainly the purpose of architecture, that it extends beyond simply the pursuit of the empty pursuit of beauty, but it's something that is purposeful and beautiful. Um, the traditional um, architecture of the Indabeli people, and uh, this wonderful image from a South African artist, which re represents for me, again, that in-between space of the uh, trading store which is in the rural areas, which brings together the Western idea of space together with the rural idea of occupation of territory and landscape, and the way in which the two meet together and form a hybrid kind of architecture. I just wanted to locate myself. We live in a very strange world today of um, iPods and Google, and when I was brought up as an architect in the mid-1970s, this is what we drew by hand. These are the great Roman arches, and that is how I was educated in architecture. So the formality that one seeks as an architect is counterpoised by this desire for informality. At one stage, um, I was uh, teaching at Witz with Pancho Guedes, and we were running a program in the mid-80s to the early 90s on the architecture of the Renaissance. This is in the middle of a great burgeoning African city in which... Um, great changes were occurring, and obviously it affected the way in which one made architecture. The original works that we did in my office were works that were really formally, cons were, were for formally constructed. There were ideas about architecture in which geometry predominated, and in which the idea of the freestanding form and space became the predominant mode of, of, of representation. A series of churches, for example, that I did when I worked for the South African Council of Churches, Again, very preoccupied with form. At the same time, though, whilst one was dealing with this world of formality and geometry and form making, we were also involved in a huge number of low-income uh, projects, working mainly for the United Democratic Front in places like Alexandra Township. And in these projects, we were working in a community-based way, very similar to the way in which Cameron was talking about previously, where people were active participants in the design process. And that set up, again, a tension, a professional architectural tension between this idea of formality and the search for order and the purity, the purity, the absolute stasis of what we consider to be architecture and this idea of people acting on it, the idea of the contingent. Um, 
the other question which I think we addressed early on in our practice, which I think is interesting to hear both the two previous speakers touch on in a kind of oblique way, is this idea that Charles um, Correa spoke about many, many years ago, which is that in uh, developing countries, space, volume, is a resource. In other words, um, every square cube or every cubic centimeter of space has value attached to it. We were involved in a series of projects which were really salutary, which were to design um, uh, 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 um, dormitory accommodation at a community center in Soweto in the mid to late 80s, which were to act as staging posts for returning ANC uh, people coming into South Africa undercover. And what we had to do was we had to work with an existing... I'm sorry. We had to work within an existing envelope of a single-story building, entirely remodel the inside of the space so that it could accommodate not 30 people but 90 people. And that required us to be incredibly resourceful in terms of space. This is the volume inside of the, um, one, house, the, the, the one residential block and the second residential block which is this one over here, was actually new built. Uh, but as you can see, people were um, accommodated at a very, very high density with a rapid turnover of the space. People were being harassed at the time. They would move in for a day or two at a time and then move on to a safe house. So that was the kind of tumultuous world, in a sense, in which our practice was being formed at that time. And one of the debates that we had in our office was that if we live in an apartheid, in that time, apartheid-divided society, and we want to talk about architecture as cultural identity, where do we look? Where do we look in our cities? And I think that we felt quite clearly that culture has to grow from the bottom up, that can't be opposed from the top down, that if we're going to look for culture and for the beginnings of cultural identity in an urban context, we had to go to the shack settlements. They were the places where people lived, the vast majority of the urban people lived there, people were acting for themselves, there was a degree of freedom with the way in which they acted on the environments which wasn't found anywhere else in our cities. So we spent some time studying shack settlements, both for research purposes, but also for the purposes of the development of our own architectural ideas. And what we decided on was to look at the system of construction that was employed by people in shack settlements and to try and learn lessons formally about that system and to try and find ways of in transforming those systems into a formal language for ourselves. So, for example, we did a series of exercises, for example, in a house such as this one, which was for a doctor friend of mine, where we used a steel frame, which became an exposed frame, uh, which was clad in a similar way to the way in which um, uh, shacks are clad, the same kind of materials, plywood panels, corrugated sheeting, and so on. And then also dealing with this idea of phenomenal versus literal transparency, the idea that what we wanted to do was to make our buildings talk to people. How do you do that? You make them literally transparent. The way you do that is you reveal the frame, and in the revealing of the frame, what you do is you reveal the spatial sequence, the idea of the section of the building on the outside of the building. So these were all attempts to try and find a way of making an architecture that, owed, uh, that had a public sense of itself, that would be able to talk to people, and start to begin to create an idea of what architecture could be like as a public art, not as a private, internal, artistic pursuit, but something that could talk to people across a variety of different languages. Um, the, the other issue that I, I also wanted to talk about, which I, I, I find so exciting about architecture, is the registration of use over time, but also this idea of contingency. The previous slide is the architectural photograph. It's before people moved into the house. This was for a single woman. She's now living in Zimbabwe, uh, married to one of the uh, cabinet ministers in Robert Mugabe's government. Um, and a, a tiny house built for nothing. I mean, it was built for literally the equivalent of 50,000 rand in its day. This is about 20 years ago. But today, it's, it's a spaza shop. Um, there's a shop on where the kitchen was, where the living room is below is a billiard table and then there are boarding house rooms above. Um, this was taken, a photograph taken by my, my partner, Heinrich Wolf, a couple of years ago. And I just love that idea, that people can appropriate space and they can take that space and use it for the most unbelievably unpredictable purposes. And I think that's what gives dynamism to architecture. Unfortunately, most of the work that we make in the world today does not offer that possibility to people. 
um, a series of um, public buildings that we did. This is a Soweto Career Center, again, a steel frame building in which the uh, frame is articulate, infill panels are used. There's an attempt to try and address you know, issues such as language, uh, transparency, literal transparency, and also the question of how it is that you can make a form that in those days we were, pre I was, we were preoccupied with culturally neutral architectural form. You know, how do you as an architect in the world today um, make, make form that can speak in an articulate way to a whole range of people from very diverse cultures and, uh, and, and backgrounds? It seemed to us that one of the ways you could start off with was by shaping form in response to at least pragmatic issues like the sun and comfort and purpose and so on. It's still a problem that vexes us because I think we're searching for this elusive thing that John Summerson spoke about. I just want to talk about this very quickly because I think it is important. 1950s, he spoke about modern architecture and he said the stuff of modern architecture is program. He said that the thing that marked modern architecture is distinct from other uh, er 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 epochs of architecture was this preoccupation with program, the idea that new social content can create new sh social form. But what Summerson said that it's precisely in that that the dilemma of modern architecture lies. Because program does not have an inherent um, uh, form of vocabulary. It does not have a language of form attached to it. So that whilst it's the, es the essence, the stuff of modern architecture, it doesn't inevitably lead to form. And that is the difficulty that I think modern architects have faced ever since then. And we're still grappling with it today. Um, I, I maybe use this a a a in a subversive way, but to, to say that um, when one talks about color, normally one talks about the pleasure of color and the appealing play of this and that and the other. These were just straightforward propaganda buildings. These were buildings built in the late 80s, and they were painted in the colors of the ANC. And the ANC flag was banned in the country at the time, so this was our little act of subversion. Uh, again, um, informal market stalls using, again, the same sort of uh, uh, um, informal techniques that one found in shack settlements, but finding ways of being able to give them a formal dignity. Now, a curious thing happened. Uh, uh, the 90s come upon us, and suddenly everyone is interested in change in South Africa, and some of our work gets a little bit of coverage in the local press, and suddenly shack chic becomes radical chic, and suddenly the stuff that we've been making in the townships, people want us to build, believe it or not, in the white areas. So, with a kind of nice, vicarious sense of humor, wicked sense of humor, we decide now's our time for payback. So we do it. And we build a series of um, office buildings uh, for uh, various developers and others in different parts of Johannesburg at the time. This is a very simple office building, typical modern office building, 11 and a half meters wide, five meter office spaces on either side of a one and a half meter corridor. But what we tried in this building was to develop an idea of being able to heat and cool these buildings independently of any form of uh, um, capital equipment. Uh, again, uh, a, a building which is a frame building with a series of um, uh, prefabricated components, but the buildings themselves started to take on quite unusual forms. Um, this is a building where uh, um, we, we have a, a system of uh, evaporative cooling, but what I think is interesting is that the, there's a series of individually operated uh, louvers on the outside of the building that are clad in shade cloth, a very, very cheap form of uh, carport covering that's found in South Africa, but which gives the building a kind of life because it, it, each, each and every single occupant of each and every single um, office can do as they see fit with um, the light conditions that uh, impact on their workspace. And then, um, uh, again, uh, uh, we did many, many of these buildings, about 15 or 20 of them at the time. Uh, this is for um, a renowned South African uh, film company called Velocity Films. Uh, done for Barry Munchik um, in Johannesburg. And uh, in this case, what we chose to do is, a, again, a, a prefabricated building with a, a structural steel frame, but we tried to limit the use of components to those kinds of components that could only be bought in local hardware shops. In other words, the, the version of Home Depot, that nothing would be made, especially for the site. And uh, that became a very interesting constraint. Incidentally, it had no impact on the cost. It didn't reduce the cost of the building in any significant way whatsoever. 
the, after 1994, I think things changed in South Africa. And I, I, I talk about this because it, it is so important to understand that I think that democracy and culture and identity are all tied together. And I think that uh, before 1994, it was extremely difficult to operate as an architect. And I think you were ducking and diving all the time. And it didn't matter what kind of um, intellectual wrangling you got up to to justify the work you did, you always landed up feeling not so good about that, that, that work and the fact that it wasn't really representative. What, what 1994 did is it opened up a whole range of opportunities for architects. And I think that um, we're still recovering from that set of opportunities. Unfortunately, we emerged into a global wor world where as we emerge blinking into the sunlight after the years of apartheid, we're suddenly thrown into the world stage and we entered into a global economy. And I think we have not recovered from that. I think if you look at Cape Town, you're going to see modern architecture in Cape Town that's not distinguished from anything else that you would find in San Diego, Sydney, or wherever. But this is just a, a series of um, buildings that uh, we've been involved in our office, and they're tiny little houses, not expensive at all, but which in a sense represent for us an attempt to sort of try and get to grips with the idea of the Cape, the landscape, and of working in South Africa. Where we're fortunate as a practice is we, we tend not to do wealthy houses, uh, houses for very wealthy people. Um, we tend to find that wealthy people make obnoxious clients, and that the people that we really like are generally not rich people. They like us. They're middle-income earners. So we land up working for friends or for people that we know well, who share our values but don't have a huge amount of money to spend. But this, this little house, for example, is uh, a house that is built in, 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 on one of the slopes uh, looking, overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. The reason why I show it to you is that it is what I think is so important about architecture. And again, it contradicts, it tries to break that utilitarian view, that planning view of architecture, which everyone seems to hold. The absolute control that we have as architects, that everything shall be measured by the architect. This is a house that was built for a very small amount of money, very quickly, as an act of desperation. It then got changed. When it got changed, it got changed in very different ways. Top plan shows the original house. The middle plan shows the addition of a little study at the back, which was needed because the space was very tight on the side. And the third one is now a little bit of money has come into the family and they've decided to build a guest cottage for visitors. Now, what this deals with for me is this idea that when we build as architects, we tend to focus so much on the future that we tend to try and predict the future that we never deal with the present. And I think the lesson for me in this house is the idea of dealing with the contingent, that you, the only reality is what is in front of you now. Everything in, ahead of us is a speculation. And that most times, architects and planners get it wrong, just like politicians do. And that the only thing that we really need to do is concern ourselves with the present. The future will take care of itself. And this house was a really good example to us in our office, at least, of that working in that way. Simply because of the way in which we managed to, in very difficult circumstances, adjust through deft footwork to these contingent kind of events that occurred once the initial house had been made. So this is the house as it is now, and then this is the way in which it's being changed over time, and then that's it as it finally will be, hopefully in a couple of months' time. These are just images of the house as it is now, and you can see fairly typical Cape architecture. Um, other, other houses, a house for a, pair of, uh, for a set of twins, both of whom are ex-South Africans but live in, in, in uh, the United States, one in New York and the other in San Francisco, they want two houses, they can become one house, they can holiday here either as two families or as one family, or they can rent it out for the rest of the year. Um, these are all houses now where I think what one can do with a degree of confidence is to start to talk about form. We can start to talk about form, we can talk about identity, we can talk about landscape. I think previously it was difficult to do so with any kind of confidence. Other houses that we've recently completed, a house for a, an actor from London who's flamboyant but has got no money, as most actors seem to have, um, and a, a tiny little retirement house for um, uh, uh, someone who wants to build a house in a milkwood forest. The reason why I show this house is that, uh, again, I think the character of the house comes from the fact that it's on Nortuk Beach, which is a famous beach for surfers and for as uh, um, uh, other people, and it takes the iconography of the house is in fact based probably upon that. 
Um, other houses that we've completed recently on the High Felt, a house for a man who's got a helicopter and he wants to park the helicopter next to his house, but still a very, very simple house, which is, uh, I think having a helicopter in, in Johannesburg or Gauteng now is probably a very sensible way of moving around with hijackings and uh, congestion. And uh, my partner Heinrich Wolf went over and spent an extended holiday in, uh, in uh, 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 Brazil recently and came back full of fire, absolutely full of fire, having seen the work of everyone from Lena Bobardi right the way through, and this is a house that we've recently completed in Johannesburg, which I think owes a lot to that trip that Heinrich made to um, uh, um, uh, Brazil. But um, an idea of, in South Africa, the idea of landscape and of a courtyarded space, which becomes a landscape space where the courtyard, in fact, becomes the house of the space. Now, a lot of other buildings that we do, this, I'm, I'm trying to give you an idea of the range. These are the series of daycare centers, the sort of things that Cameron was talking about, which are being built now, thank God, by the state. The state are appointing and commissioning architects to build public buildings in uh, previously disadvantaged areas right throughout the country and putting a huge amount of investment into that. These are a series of um, small daycare centers that we've built where in a sense, what we've tried to do is collapse the idea of a distinction drawn between private and public realms, where part of the building gives itself over to the street and creates public seats, streets, and public uh, lobby spaces. And a series of schools. Um, schools that start to, uh, again, collapse the distinction between the idea of a school surrounded by a fence, where, for example, the specialist classrooms of the school front onto a street and they then, in turn, can become specialist shops that parents can use to sell goods outside of school hours so that additional income can be generated by the school. Uh, a school recently completed in Danoon, um, which uh, really tries, in a, in a way, through its iconography, language, and coloring, to find a way of being able to tie itself into um, uh, the informal settlement that surrounds it. I'm going to go very quickly through these. I just want to, some housing that we did some time ago, which again, um, uh, just for Cameron so that he can understand in South Africa and everyone else here, we have in South Africa a form of uh, government which is referred to centralized democracy. You could argue that it's just a form of benign dictatorship. We have um, a housing ministry where the Minister of Housing decides on the housing for the country. She stands up uh, in public uh, arenas and uh, addresses the country and tells poor people that we need to educate you so that you can appreciate the houses that we make for you. It's the kind of person that we've got running housing policy in our country. Now, we tried to confront that with the Swedish government and we built a series of experimental houses in Port Elizabeth and the local politicians as well as national politicians got so scared about the work that we were doing because they thought that it would cause people to turn away from the houses they were producing that they rubbished it. And the local CEDA representative was returned to Stockholm in disgrace because apparently it stepped outside the bounds and we weren't allowed to continue with the work. So political interference in housing is huge in this country. There are huge agendas flying around. And I'm afraid at the present moment we have a Ministry of Housing, it has a paternalistic view towards the provision of housing that is not much different from the apartheid government. Some housing that we did that hasn't yet been built, but uh, is part of the end to housing gateway, which is a way of trying to reconceptualize housing and to move it away from um, uh, considering housing to be uh, um, family housing, but rather housing to be, uh, to be serviced rooms and the people can aggregate themselves around a number of service rooms that they might not either need to support their family or they might need to rent out or use uh, as, as a way of um, uh, generating income. Um, the other thing that we did in a very provocative way was, uh, if I go through here, was to say, we don't want any longer to buy into this idea that you have zoning that you have a zoned land for house, and you have a zoned land for a school, and you have whatever. We'll create courtyards, and we'll bury public buildings in the courtyards, and we'll give the people who surround those courtyards privileged access to those facilities. But we'll design it in such a way that everyone can use those facilities. And it's really just an attempt to sort of try and subvert this idea of segregation, separation, and zoning, which seems to be such a legacy that has come to us from, you know, uh, 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 modern town planning. 
um, and then a series of speculations. One of probably the most interesting projects we're involved at the moment, which deals with the idea of sustainability, um, has to do with um, the Philippi, uh, um, uh, the, the, the Philippi um, uh, housing project that we're engaged in, which really has to do with the idea of uh, productive landscape. And it's something that I don't think has been considered very deeply in South Africa at the present time. Productive landscape, I think, is a very interesting idea in the sense that um, it's to try and turn land around so that people can use it to farm intensively and that that product that is produced can either be used to sustain that family through the conduct of their, you know, through their daily, daily lives and, in fact, if it's done properly, can be used to sustain a surplus profit. So in a, what, what we've uh, done in the, this Philippi project, as you can see over here, is... Uh, We've created three zones. It's a huge, big piece of ground next to an old um, cement factory surrounded by shack settlements. But we've created three zones of uh, um, um, uh, productive landscape. The garden of the house, uh, the common allotments, and then the commercial agricultural <coughs> land. Um, we're hoping to build it. Um, the, um, uh, the project has a public street that runs through it, which connects the shack settlements to Lansdowne Road. <coughs> And that's lined in turn with higher order activities such as shopping and greengrocer shops and, and, and flats and uh, accommodation and so forth. But what, what is interesting about this project is the density we're building at is no different from the densities that are being built at the present moment by the government and most um, government-sponsored housing projects. So with a little bit of judicious planning, you can scrunch people together in one corner of the site, release a lot more land that can be in turn used for um, uh, productive use, and you can generate a huge amount of revenue for those people. There will be 400 families living on the site of whom we estimate 200 will be able to live off the produce that's produced on the land. And this is right in the midst of one of the most highly dense residential areas in Cape Town. Um, in Cape Town, we're involved in a whole lot of conservation projects. This is uh, an old warehouse where we put a hat onto it, and I'm not going to talk too much about that, but to just give you a bit of a punt for our practice and say we do conservation work as well. Finally, I'm, I'm going to end off um, on this project, which is uh, a project that seems to have got a lot of publicity, um, but um, we're still mystified why, because we think all our work is good. Um, but it's, no, I'm joking. I, I've got to just keep quiet, Joy. I'm sorry, otherwise I'll blow it. Um, it's, a comp it's, a, it's a project that we won in competition. Um, whilst I agree with um, Cameron that competitions, there's a huge waste of social capital, I can't see any other way in which young architects can get a foothold in the architectural marketplace. So I support open competitions. And we should have, everything should be open competitions because it's the only way in which we can loosen up the kind of awful grasp that the big timers have over the architectural profession in this country and elsewhere around the world. We would have never got a chance to build what we're building now in red location if, we hadn't, if it hadn't been for the competition system. So we support it hugely. But um, it's, uh, red location is um, a township. Uh, it's part of the New Brighton Township outside Port Elizabeth. It's over 100 years old. There's a railway line over here. It's a traditional pattern of uh, urban development under apartheid. Black people congregate, uh, aggregated, spatially aggregated and segregated from white areas put into township areas, which are dormitory areas only, separated usually by either a highway or a railway line. With the factories across the railway line, people move from the dormitory to sell their labor during the day, come back at night time to sleep to replenish their labor and go back to work the next day. A kind of really abysmal um, uh, um, uh, way of life. But this area that we were um, asked to redevelop as part of the competition uh, is a very old part of, Red uh, of New Brighton, probably the oldest um, existing black township in uh, the Eastern Cape, formerly constituted um, urban black township, and is over 120 years old. Images of the original um, red location, which was, uh, in fact, um, uh, an army camp for British soldiers um, after the Boer War, and the soldiers moved out about two years after the war in 1902, and um, black families, first settled black families moved in. Uh, it was a crucible of um, struggle, um, uh, activity in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s 
first activist campaign against apostles was waged there. This is an image of Desmond Tutu at her funeral in, in New Brighton, not in red location, in the 1980s. Um, the leadership of the ANC and the Eastern Cape was drawn from their governor, Becky, Raymond and Schlaub, and a whole bunch of others. Um, the images of the site as it is today and the people who live there. What's extraordinary about red location, which you find in most shack settlements, is there's one story that's told on the outside of the building, which is of a fairly low grade, low quality exterior environment. And once you go inside of the um, uh, shacks, in this case here, for example, this woman is a nurse working at Doris in Giza Hospital just down the road, a fantastically appointed inside apartment. It's almost as if she wants to hide away from the world. And some of the leadership, these are images taken by David Goldblatt, a famous South African photographer of some of the people who led the struggle um, against apartheid, who came from red location, including Governor Mbeki, who's the, who was the father of our, our president, uh, Thabo Mbeki, and uh, who lived in red location and whose idea, and the competition was his idea. Red location as it is today, and it gives you an idea of the, con it, it really is an interesting story about urban redevelopment in South Africa. There you have the Bay of Port Elizabeth with the um, city of Port Elizabeth in the background. These are the remnants of um, old red location. These are the 100-year-old uh, buildings that we are going to conserve and find new uses for with the shacks that were built in between. And that's the new housing that the state is building for these people. And they're being decanted from red location into the new houses. Um, two things that um, uh, I, I just really briefly wanted to talk about. Uh, I've got five or ten more minutes. The, the first one was public, public language, or language of architecture and identity. How do you, post-1994, make buildings in South Africa that are public buildings that can talk to people about the nature of public architecture? You know, the community of faith that bound together the Gothic or the classical or the whatever, 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 has disappeared. Um, so, you know, do you make it a blob? Do you make it look like a bird? Do you make it look like the carcass of a whale? I mean, I, you, wh where do you begin? Um, and, and I think that one of the things that we confronted in the idea of the design of the museum was this idea of let's search back in popular art and let's have a look at how people represent the idea of city. Because I think it's when you look at popular art that you really find people starting to express, even in unconscious ways, ideas that have a kind of unity amongst a whole group of others. And what we found, particularly in the trade union posters of the time, were these images, always, of the double-storied school building, the single-storied houses, and the sawtooth factory. And the sawtooth factory was always associated with trade union activity, not with selling your labor and being exploited but rather with trade union activity and for those people who were in South Africa in the 80s and 90s, you will all know that the struggle for freedom in South Africa was not fought just by the exiles outside the country, but by people within the country, and particularly through the trade union movement. So in a sense, the sawtooth roof is a symbol of civic virtue in our view, that it has some kind of sense in people's minds. It's public, it's where people go to work. It's a place where uh, struggle for freedom was fought, and it's associated with trade union activity. So that was the first thing that I think really meant something to us. The second one was this idea of the memory box. We had to design a, 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 a museum, and, and the question was, how do you design a museum for people who don't know about museums? And um, how, do you, how do you represent the past? For example, one of the things that, again, we were concerned about was we didn't want our past in this country to get misrepresented as it did under the apartheid government's history. What the apartheid government did is they selectively chose parts of history that supported the idea of white nationalism, excluded almost everything else, and that's what we were force-fed as school kids. And that created huge divisions in the country. We're still recovering from it. We don't want the ANC to do the same thing to our history. We want everyone's history to be represented. It has to be an inclusive history. How do you design a museum that can do that? Because what museums tend to do is they tend to simplify history. They tell it as one single story. The original um, competition was to um, design. Uh, sorry, I should keep an eye on time. The original competition was to design um, a precinct, which we're busy doing at the moment. We're building the precinct. The first building is the museum. We're doing a, a, a school and various other things. I'll show you that now. 
Uh, this is the final plan which we are busy developing now as an um, urban, urban plan for um, uh, New Brighton. New Brighton is a town of 400,000 people. And the idea is that this uh, precinct will become the cultural precinct not only of New Brighton but also of Port Elizabeth. It will include the museum, it will include um, an art gallery, art school, um, conference centre, um, formal theatre, um, a, a, a cinema centre for showing of African art, movie, uh, 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 movies, um, a music school um, and an archive for uh, uh, Eastern Cape um, uh, history as told through the newspapers and through various other artifacts, including some of the ANC documentation that has gone to Fort Hare, and uh, a, a virtual library and internet cafe. So it really is going to be to create a proper center for uh, New Brighton, where people can go for music, they can go to learn, and they, the idea is to merge education and cultural production into one single process. So people go there to learn about the arts, but they'll produce things, and those things will then have a market that can be sold there. Um, the, the museum as it is now, and uh, um, uh, a reading of the building um, as, as, as it is. It, it looks rather large at the moment, but you've got to understand it's the first of six or seven buildings, so it's an isolated building at the moment, but it will be integrated later. With the 12 memory boxes with the entrance space over here, gigantic big public plaza, and um, a way through the building, which I'll talk about just now. Um, this is a very important drawing. It's part of the kind of... We, yeah, how do we work in our office? We still do hand drawings, but we also work on computer. So we, we, we work with a, a mixture of um, uh, media. But this is very typical of the sort of drawings that we would make in the office, which is both um, a technical drawing, but it's also a rendered drawing that starts to talk about the idea of space. But what is quite important about this drawing, and I think it's important when you talk about the idea of memory, is uh, Andreas Hazen talks about twilight of memory. And he talks about twilight of memory as this thing of, Something happens and it slips into the past. And it's at that slipping point that you have this idea of twilight. And he says that twilight period is actually the period where we make decisions about what we want to remember and what we want to forget. So in a sense, for us, the most important space is this is a typical memory box. It's about 12 meters tall. And inside of it is contained a particular theme that deals with the idea of struggle. But for us, the most important space is the space in between the boxes, because that's the twilight space. I mean, metaphorically, you could say that you've got the outside, which is the present, the past is inside of the box, and this in-between space is the twilight space. It's the space of reflection where things start to fit together. And I think that becomes quite important in the reading of the spaces in, in the museum. Um, the elevational treatments, you know, obviously issues of scale and so forth, to try and sort of find a way of being able to bring a big building, which is almost 15 meters tall, and deal with the, the, the scale of, of shacks and houses. Uh, but this section, I think, tells a huge amount about the spatial sequence within the actual museum itself. Uh, the building. Ah, I, went, I wanted to show this um, uh, uh, image. Uh, this is a photoshopped image. Didn't happen like that, okay? Um, uh, one of my colleagues at uh, UCT, you know, architects are, are incredibly bitchy um, to, towards each other. So uh, he, he went around town saying, you know, do you see what they have to do to their building? You have to Photoshop people in it because otherwise they don't get any people at their building, you see? Um, so in other words, what he was saying is that the community had to be Photoshopped into the image because they weren't involved in the project. A load of nonsense. If anyone who knows anything about photography will know, if you want to take a photograph of a building at a particular time of day, you have to actually have a high, long exposure. And if you have that, you kind of people walking in front. So you photograph it without people, then you photograph people in the same place, but with a different exposure, and then you put them into the photograph. So just, just so that we clarify that, in case any of you heard that, heard that terrible piece of um, gossip from someone who shall remain not anonymous, but I'm sure most people who are connected to UCT will know who I'm talking to. Um, but the, 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 the remarkable idea about the building, um, which, which I think is absolutely extraordinary, it has nothing to do with us as architects. It has to do with the people who commissioned the building, the idea of the building. Is, can you imagine the confidence and the leap of faith that people must have, whether they're politicians, who were largely politicians, including Goblin and Becky and Tabo and Becky as well, to actually say, we want to build a uh, commission um, a, a, a museum of quite some substance. This is the equivalent of 20 million rand, which in US dollar terms is about 3 million US dollars, which is a lot of money for a building in this country, in the middle of a shack settlement. 
as a testimony to the struggle of those people and to use the experience of the people, the lived experience of the people around the museum as the real stuff, the material for the museum itself. I think it's an extraordinary idea. And I think it could only happen in South Africa. It couldn't have happened anywhere else in the world. And I think that's the testimony to our years of struggle and this fantastic period that we're entering into now, except for the Minister of Housing. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the building itself, uh, there, are, there are fragments of old buildings which um, uh, are, are um, shown here, but uh, I, I, I think it's a bit difficult to really explain to you what the museum will look like in its new setting until the new buildings are built around it, which we're hoping to get completed by 2010 in time for the World Cup because Port Elizabeth has a quarterfinal berth in the World Cup. Um, other things that happen on the building, and I think it's something that we're now starting to explore in our, in our office. I think you saw it in the Danoon School, that beautiful school with the gigantic big star on the facade, is this idea of mural art, of the idea of how do you identify... How, we, we, we make so many assumptions about people that they understand these arcane processes that we move through as architects and trying to sort of make form. Um, and we just assume that, you know, if people don't understand it, then they've got to be educated. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been to Institute of Architects meetings where people say, you know, the problem with the public is they don't understand what we do. What we need to do is get into the primary schools and educate those kids. God forsake it. If we had to do that to the kids, what they do to the students of schools of architecture, we'd have a really screwed up population. So... What we're saying is what we should be doing with our buildings is maybe making them visually literate. Plaster things on buildings. Do murals. Use murals to tell the story of the building, to tell the story of the architecture. For example, in the case of this building, we took a photograph of one of the houses. It was taken 10 years ago, blew it up to billboard side and plastered on the side of the, of, of, the, of the building. The impact that that has had is absolutely extraordinary. People come and... First of all, people used to come and tell their stories and tell other people about the fact that they were in the photograph and who was there and who wasn't still living and so on. So it became part of the tapestry, the storytelling experience. Now the tourists have come there, people stand next to it and they say, that's me in the photograph, can I please have some money? Which is a real sad consequence of tourism. But if you have a look over here, you can see the relationship between the um, actual building and uh, the, the, the shacks themselves, it's embedded in a residential area. And again, part of our preoccupation, collapsing this distinction drawn between zonings, the idea that you can have one use here and another use there, push everything together and try and find a way of getting it to work as one single cohesive whole. A tomb which has created a huge um, furor, and part of it has to do with the fact that we were going to, the ANC in the Eastern Cape wanted to bury Raymond and Schlaub and uh, Rebury, Raymond and Schlaub and uh, uh, Govan and Becky, um, a, a la um, Lenin's tomb in Moscow in the museum. And a debate arose between the family, who said, we own the bo bodies and we don't want you to rebury them in the museum, and the ANC as a, as a political organization saying, these people belong, their memory belongs to the people of this country because they're heroes of the struggle. And we therefore say that because their memories are owned by the people of the country, that we should decide where they should be buried. And it hasn't been resolved, but it's an interesting question. I think this is a, 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 um, a shot for me that really, um, uh, an, an, an image that, that really conveys the kind of seriousness of that um, uh, space that I was talking about, a twilight space. And some images of the opening of the building. And one of the first displays that's gone into one of the memory boxes, guess what? The interior of a shack. That's an extraordinary idea. We were kind of interested in that. We thought, that's a bit hokey. You know, I mean, why do you want to do that? And people who asked for it from the local community said, we feel more comfortable coming into the museum, going to memory box, and sitting there and telling our stories than telling them in our own houses. Our own houses are too personal, too close to us. We can go into the museum and we can tell our stories. The distance removes us. Just to end, I want to read a quote, which I think really sums up the position that, 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 that we have um, in, in our practice. It's, I've paraphrased it, it's my language, but it comes from essentially the work of Neil Leach. And he says that architects have become increasingly intoxicated with images and image making. And I think in South Africa already, you know, we hear people talk about the money shot, the one single shot of the building that you design before the building's built that goes into all the magazines. 
to the, to the detriment of their pre profession, the sensory stimulation induced by these images has a narcotic effect that diminishes social and political awareness, leaving architects cosseted within their aesthetic cocoons, remote from the actual concerns of everyday life. The intoxication of the aesthetic leads to an aesthetics of intoxication and a consequent lowering of aesthetic awareness. What results is a culture of mindless consumption where there is no longer the possibility of meaningful discourse. In such a culture, the only effective strategy is one of seduction. Architectural design is reduced to the superficial play of empty, seductive forms, and philosophy is appropriated as an intellectual veneer to justify these terms. Thank you very much.